saying I care about language is really just a euphemistic way of saying I like to tell people that they are wrong. Um, and we all care about language. Um, I don't doubt for a minute that people who have peeves care about language. Uh, the question for me is whether we care enough about language to uh, learn something about it. And the, the most immutable aspect of any healthy language is that it is, in fact, mutable. Um, healthy languages change and dead languages remain static. You know, so we don't have a lot of people complaining about the you know, variation. Latin anymore. Um, this is not a revolutionary concept. Most of us have accepted this long ago. Anyone who's ever had to read Beowulf kind of understands that the English of today is markedly different than the English of your um, unintended. But, but accepting something and liking it are really not the same thing. And the, uh, the tricky thing with language change is that once we accept the change will occur, we also have to accept that we cannot control that change. That's very difficult to do. But it's not, it's not enough to simply say that something is wrong. I, I think what we have to do is ask why it is wrong. Um, so this book that I've written, Bad English, is a, is a guide to some of the aspects of the language that have most excited people over the past few hundred years in an examination of why this is so. 
Um, my wife likes to refer to it as um, a history of the things that we think are correct. And uh, I think this is a pretty good description. So what I'd like to do tonight is go over some of the most cherished of our peas and to kind of dissect them and see how they came about. And uh, I hope that we will have some time at the end for inventing. And uh, I, I really welcome the mention of any peas from you. Uh, in the beginning with one of my favorite complaints, I'd like to look at the word decimate. And uh, I should add, by the way, that well, most of the peas we're going to look at tonight uh, have been around for a while. Some of them have a kind of short life and come and go. Does anybody here remember when President Harding was running for president? He <laughs> <laughs> was excoriated for using the word normalcy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, somebody remembers. So most people don't really think of normalcy as a real problem or anything. But uh, if, if something I'm talking about doesn't seem to be a problem, so you just take that as a sign of youth. Um, <laughs> most of you are probably familiar with complaints about destiny, which is that it shouldn't be used to mean wiping out completely for the simple reason that it comes from a Latin word that referred to a military punishment, which is one in which one of every ten soldiers was punished. Uh, now people have been worrying about this since 1870, when the noted language school, Richard Grant White, took issue with the way that people used decimation. And he said to use decimation as a general phrase for great slaughter is simply ridiculous. Um, subsequent to White's denunciation of this word, other people took up the cudgel on behalf of the verb form, and decided that decimate should also not be used to imply the act of slaughtering great numbers. It should only be used to slaughter one out of every ten. Now, does this make sense? Um, you know, on the one hand, I think it's really admirable if you have a word that you find pleasing to want to keep for qualities that make it seem special. However, it's um, somewhat problematic if you are not prepared to be consistent. So if you claim that decimate should only mean killing one out of every ten because that was the first meaning of the word, then what will you do if you find out that decimate actually had a different meaning before that one? And well, let's find out. Um, first of all, the earliest meaning of decimate, uh, decimation uh, had nothing to do with slaughtering people unless you consider your um, checking account because it was a word for tithing to the church. Um, this comes at first in 1526 to forge excommunications for tithes and decimations. It is their continual exercise from a uh, not at all famous work by William Barlow, Read Me, and Be Not Roth. Um, so that uh, predates decimate as a verb by about 70 years. And then decimate as a verb, um, well, it's kind of difficult to say what its first meaning was because it had two meanings at the same exact time, both of which came up in about 1600. Uh, the first one there is um, the one that we all love to try to protect, um, the military punishment, and then the second one by Enoch Kleckman is talking about the tithing sense of the word. Um, so when you have two sources this close in date from about 400 years ago, it's really not possible to say which one preceded the other. Um, it's probably likely that both of them are the same in use at the same time. There, there are very few dictionaries in this, this time that define decimate, but the ones that do either define it solely as the tie or they give both meanings. Now, what about the disputed meaning for widespread slaughter? Uh, that's what we might call the Johnny Come Lately. It has only been in English used for about 350 years now since the middle of the 17th century. Um, so it's not really clear which form of decimate claimed first, and it's, uh, it's not clear if the earliest use of the word is from the Latin word for tithing or for punishment, but it's very clear that the tithing sense of decimation came before all of them. Um, but there's another problem with insisting, I'm insisting on this kind of rigid adherence to the meaning of decimate, um, and that's the fact that we're really uh, we're selectively comfortable with um, words like this change of meaning. So, um, is there anybody here who would sit up and protest if you heard of a, a performer receiving a standing ovation? Probably not. Um, uh, but if you have a problem with decimate changing meaning, you should also have a problem with ovation, because both words come from Latin military terms, and ovation used to refer to the reception that was given a commander who had a minor victory but not a full triumph. It's kind of like the bronze medal of applause. Um, <laughs> and a hundred years ago, um, some language commentators were saying that this is the only meaning of ovation and that it should never be used to refer to a um, standing ovation because it just doesn't make sense. Yet somehow we've accepted this new meaning of ovation and Western civilization has not fallen by the wayside. 
Um, it, I'd also like to note that Richard Grant White, the man who started us on the uh, decimate, decimation problem path, he was not held in particularly high esteem by his fellow writers. Um, he really had a little more than classical education in a mountain spleen and set out in the later half of the 19th century and passed judgment on the linguistic habits of Americans. And, uh, he also thought that real estate was a pretentious intruder from the technical province of law. He thought that ice cream should instead be iced cream. Presidential was not a legitimate word, and that photographers should really be photographist. And um, <laughs> his books, of course, sold very, very well. Um, that's turning for a, a minute now to another favorite word of the chief national set, and that is enormity. Um, and many people like to think that this word properly means great wickedness and feel somewhat put upon when somebody uses it to mean anything else, but especially if it is used to mean something that is very large. Um, and this gave at a real moment in the sun a few years ago, Barack Obama used enormity to mean something that was very large um, several times. And uh, his use of it was even mentioned in a language book in 2011 uh, titled Strictly English, which said that one should not speak of the enormity of the task, but of its enormousness, even if one is the president of the United States. Um, <laughs> It's a great, maybe kind of snarky comment there. But the problem with making these kinds of pronouncements is that you kind of run the risk of being poisoned and um, the tarred. The first 200 years that enormousness existed in English, it only had one meaning. This is for all of the 17th and 18th century, and enormousness only meant great wickedness. And it wasn't until the 19th century that enormousness began to mean very large. Um, and the same thing for enormous. The first meaning of enormous in English was something. Um, and it wasn't until somewhat later that it began to mean something large. Um, so it's odd that we, we accept that certain words have changed meaning, but other words um, will not. Um, it's true that the earliest use of enormity in English does refer to great wickedness. It's been used since about 1477, and it didn't come to refer to large size until the 1530s. But I think that we can kind of extend this courtesy to enormity, considering so many other similar words have changed. But, uh, Putting aside semantics for the time being, I'd like to turn our attention to the always crowd-pleasing topic of a functional shift. Um, and for those of you who dozed off in linguistics class in college, um, functional shift is the term we use when a word has a midlife crisis, decides to buy a silly red sports car, and changes its part of speech. And uh, for some reason, this has the ability to bother a great number of people, even though tens of thousands of those words have done exactly this. Um, and here, under the category of impact is not a verb, um, one of the words in this category that leaves people most upset is the use of impact as a verb. And looking at the screen here, we can see some very sensible advice from the writer, Marsha Pounds, uh, talking about the execrable writing habits of business people who insist on using the word thusly. She writes, and I don't know how many times executives incorrectly use the word impact. Impact is not a verb. However, as we can see from this next slide, the <laughs> siren call of verbal impact is too strong to resist, even for Marsha Pounds, as we find her using it this matter six years after her initial declaration. Um, the Depot's third quarter results were negatively impacted, etc. And for those of you who don't quite get why this might be a problem, the issue is that impact ostensibly functions quite nicely as a noun, and we should all agree to leave well enough alone. Um, however, this tends to overlook well, the fact that impact also functioned quite nicely as a verb, and it did so for about 200 years before it became used as a noun. Um, so this is a, a fine example of functional shift, just not quite in the way that we think. Um, another example of functional shift is the fact that a fair amount of disparagement is the use of um, contact as a verb. And this took off in the 1920s after Theodore Dreiser used the word um, as a verb in an American tragedy, and some British reviewers decided, as British reviewers are so fond of doing, that this must be evidence of an American doing something new and unseemly to their language. Um, as a P, it's really largely faded from, from view, but strong and white argued against it and elements of style, so some people really hold on to it, and also just don't like it for various other reasons. And I'm, I have to confess that I included it here mainly because I wanted to quote one of my favorite passages of writing on the subject of language. This is a, 
a memo that was sent out in 1931 uh, to managers of the Western Union Telegraph Company by an executive there, um, one man named Frederick Leno. Uh, I feel like I have to read this next one in a movie preview voice. Um, as somewhere there cumbers this fair earth with his loathsome presence, a man who for the common good should have been destroyed in early childhood. He is the originator of the hideous vulgarism of using compact as a verb. So long as we can meet, get in touch with, make the acquaintance of, be introduced to, call on, interview, or talk to people, there can be no apology for contact. Um, this was then leaked to the press. A lot of people had fun with you know, the declaration. But, um, as it turns out, contact has been used as a verb since the beginning of the 1700s, starting in England of all places. So, uh, the no was correct neither in his assessment of the word's chronology nor of its propriety. Uh, but I am personally willing to concede him points on the basis of his eloquence. I think um, if you're going to attack the language use of others, at least do so with style, and he certainly did. Um, but I'd like to turn away from questions regarding usage of individual words and focus briefly on points of grammar. And two of these that perennially seem to lay on minds of people who like to worry about these things are um, whether it's correct to abandon your prepositions at the end of the sentence, and of course, whether there is anything wrong with splitting an infinitive. Um, now, the case against uh, ending a sentence with a preposition may not be the longest um, burning flame in the history of linguistic peevery, but it is one of the, uh, it's not the brightest burning flame, but it's one of the longest running. It's been around um, since the middle of the uh, 17th century for a long time. And credit for this rule was awarded to the poet John Dryden, who so disliked um, ending sentences with prepositions that he republished a book of his own poem 16 years after it first came out, just so he could take the prepositions and move them up in the sentences. Um, however, recent evidence is Sharon, there is an early equivalent of a grammarian named Joshua Poole who had this idea before John Dryden. He decided in 1646 that um, having prepositions at the end of the sentence violated the natural order of English, which, by the way, is just not true. And he uh, suggested changing this is the man I told you of to this is the man of whom I told you. Similar examples. Um, by the time the 18th century rolled around, the rule had taken on new adherence and was expanded to include not ending a sentence with a preposition or any other inconsiderable word, although not, nobody really seems to have ever been entirely clear on what an inconsiderable word was, but many people just say don't end sentences with inconsiderable words. And the thing that I find most uh, peculiar about this rule is its longevity, since for the last 150 years, pretty much every usage guide and writer in language, no matter how prescriptive they are, has agreed that ending a sentence with a preposition is just fine. Um, and these are three generally prescriptive guides to language, the American Heritage Dictionary, Brian Garner, a fine writer and author of modern American usage, and Strunk and White, and all three of them pretty much just agree, this is fine, um, there's no problem with it. Um, so why do we all have this kind of vague sense of unease that weighs on us when we end a sentence with a preposition? And uh, my feeling is we can blame college writing centers. It's always nice to have somebody to blame. Um, and in researching this book, I found that there's an astonishing large number of writing center web pages, all of which are affiliated with college institutions. And they, they still cling to this notion that this is wrong. And um, there you go. And the writing center at the University of Nevada says, uh, avoid any sentence preposition, and you can do so without the resulting sentence being tortured in it's a nice kind of a nuanced position. And Arizona State says just simply should generally avoid not to should try to not end sentence prepositions. My favorite is um University of Iowa, <coughs> which says it has become acceptable to end a sentence with a preposition in conversation speech. Term papers, however, should not be written in conversation. Is anybody have not figured that one out yet? Um, and to me, this last example is wonderfully illogical. I think that term papers can be written in non-conversational fashion. They can include sentence terminal prepositions and still be entirely appropriately boring. Um, one addition to this before we move on is that Winston Churchill is often quoted on the subject of terminal prepositions and it's usually something along the lines of his having been 
given a speech back that he wrote with the prepositions moved around and Churchill scrawling in the margin, something along the lines of, this is the sort of nonsense up with which I will not put. Um, <laughs> it's a, a great story, but as with so many other quotes of Winston Churchill, it seems to not um, have any basis to it. Um, ben Zimmer, who writes about language for the Wall Street Journal, looked into it and found earlier evidence of other people saying it, and no evidence whatsoever of Churchill actually having said or written this. Um, now, the, the terminal preposition and the straight infinitive have something else in common, I mean, something aside of both being more of a rule, sort of largely ignored by people who use the English language, um, and that they were both created in an ostensible attempt to make English comport with the rules of Latin. Um, unfortunately, English is not a romance language. Um, we do have the majority of our vocabulary, about 70 or 80 percent, comes from Latin Greek sources, but the structure of our sentence in the language is um, entirely Germanic. Um, you can see evidence of this by the fact that it's very easy to create a sentence in English that has no Latin words in it, but you cannot create any sentences in English that do not have some Germanic root in them. Um, but split infinitives were objected to on grounds that there should never be anything coming between a verb and its infinitive. Um, since this was not done in Latin, and it was not done in Latin for the simple reason that um, the infinitive in that language is formed with a single word, so you could not split it. Um, most linguists, linguists of the English agree that this is also the case in English, that the word to is not actually part of the infinitive of the verb, but let's leave scientists out of this for a minute. And, uh, we can look at how we commonly think of, or what we commonly think of this the split infinitive and how it came to stick in the crawl of so many people. Uh, back in the good old days of the 12th century, nobody split their infinitives. Um, this was not done, we know this was not done for two reasons. And one is that English was a highly inflected language, just like Latin. And we didn't have silly little words like two running around yet. And also the, uh, the literacy rate was so low that we have no written record of how the uneducated people spoke or wrote, so we have no idea whether they were actually breaking this rule. It didn't exist yet. But in the uh, 13th century, when Old English kind of morphed into Middle English and lost some of its inflections, people started using the word to and then started to put words between to and the following verb. And uneducated boars like Chaucer and Wycliffe used to slip their infinitives, and we all know that they came to a bad end, probably because of this. Um, <laughs> And then for reasons that are entirely unknown, the split infinitives themselves split in the sense that they disappeared almost entirely for the next 400 years. From 1400 to 1800, there are almost no uses of this construction, although some people have speculated that Shakespeare used it once in Sonnet 142 when he wrote, Thy pity may deserve to pity be. Um, the split infinitives appeared to have died and not um, through any efforts of Grammarians, because nobody was complaining about them yet. Um, but it wasn't dead, it was just taking a very long nap. And uh, at the end of the 18th century, they suddenly started coming up again. Again, we, we don't know why. Um, people just started putting them in their mouths and decided they liked the way it tasted. And soon enough, the split infinitive was everywhere. And this was viewed now as a problem, and so people started looking for a solution. And um, for a long time, the credit for this rule. No splitting infinitives was thought to have originated with Bishop Louth, a very prescriptive grammarian. The only grammarian I know of who had his own website just devoted to him, which was unfortunately enough titled um, Bishop Louth is a Fool. Um, <laughs> and even more sadly, the website is now defunct. But um, in the middle of the 19th century, he was complaining about it. But it did come up before him. And the, the earliest mention I've seen of not splitting infinitives comes up in 1803. And, um, a small and not at all influential grammar book written by a man named John Conley. Um, now, the, the complaints about splitting infinitives have been about as even tempered and sedate as grammatical quibbles usually are. Um, it's been called an abomination, an ugly thing, and a weed which grows rankly in the garden of the journalists. Um, if these statements echo your own sentiments on the split infinitive, and if you take delight in taking umbrage of its use, you're in luck because uh, the construction shows no signs of going away anytime soon. So you will always have some small annoyance to keep you warm at night. Um, now, uh, another word that I like to talk about that functions quite well in providing this kind of warm blanket of contempt is um, a, a four-letter word 
Germanic origins with um, a K at the end of it. And of course, I'm referring to the word like. Um, like is this gift that keeps on giving since once the uh, original problematic usage was largely accepted by English speakers, managed to find another way to lie us up. And the first usage that bothered people was famously documented in an advertising campaign by Winston Cigarettes, which is, um, Winston tastes good like a cigarette should. Um, back in the 1950s, before cigarettes were bad for you, they, um, they used to be advertised on the television. Um, one night in 15, oh, sorry, 1956, Walter Cronkite, uh, the most trusted man in America, was given an advertising script to read on the evening news, which was common practice at the time. And when he was told to be Winston's ad, he dug in his heels and refused. Now, um, Cronkite's refusal to read the script was not based on the inappropriateness of using the most prestigious position in broadcast journalism to hawk an addictive and carcinogenic drug. Um, his refusal was based on much nobler principles than that. He objected on the grounds that light should not be used as a conjunction. Um, and so instead he read as a cigarette should. Um, now, this advertised went elsewhere and millions of people were scandalized. Uh, the conjunctive use of light is widely objected to and Winston Needless to say, was delighted with the publicity. Uh, enough so that they created a television ad in 1970 with a college English teacher droning on and on about grammar until his entire classroom of sprightly young students jumps up waving packets of cigarettes around and singing, what do you want, good grammar or good taste? Uh, <laughs> now, unfortunately, I couldn't find this particular video, but um, I did find another one that I think we can run at um, from about the same time period. Married one whole year. Happy anniversary, Donnie. Yeah, uh, I've got a great job, son. A cookie? The grammar. What's the taste look like the cigarette should? Uh, not a good grammar, it's a taste. I uh, want you to stop calling your mother every day. Twice a week. I'll smoke for that. Pardon my grammar, but when Stan tastes good like a cigarette should. Um, we can observe several social changes that have occurred since the came out. Uh, number one, mother-in-law jokes are no longer the default mode of humor in television ads. Um, two, sharing a cigarette after a meal at a restaurant is no longer considered a sign of a healthy marriage. <laughs> Three, few people really seem to care about whether you use light as a conjunction. Uh, now, light as a conjunction has been around in English since the 1300s, and it took another 400 years before people began to get wary about it. Um, the first one was a man named James Elphinstone, who did so in a book with a curious title of uh, The Principles of the English Language Digested. Um, I'm not sure what he meant there, but um, as for where it comes from, many people, by which I mean at least three or four historical linguists, seem to think that it was a shortened form of like as. Um, but after the conjunctive of uh, like stopped bothering people, I think at the end of the 20th century, uh, like changed its spots and found a new way to get under people's skin. And now when you hear people complaining about it, it's most often in the context of because it's a meaningless word that kids use, like. Um, now I'd like to point out there are certain truisms in the study of language. And one of these is that when somebody tells you that a word has a terribly entertaining etymology, they are almost always wrong. Um, Another one is that when people tell you that a word is useless and meaningless, they're usually wrong as well. Um, the meaning of life can be difficult to tease out, but it's there, and the word certainly serves a function. And there's a, a wonderful linguist named Alexander Darcy who looked into the myths around life and found that they're pretty much unfounded. For instance, it's really not only young people who use the word, it extends from 8 to 80. Um, and she, she found four primary uses of life that were thought to be meaningless, and I put them on a slide in case anybody wants to give themselves a headache trying to remember them. Um, so here's what they are. There's the quotative compartmentalizer. I was like, ew. Um, <laughs> the, the funniest part is me trying to actually replicate a social register I'm not familiar with. Um, this use of like function is to indicate that a quoted bit of speech is about to follow. And the second use is the approximative adverb. That book is like 200 pages long. Um, 
and in this case, like serves to indicate that some approximation of distance or quantity is soon to follow. Uh, number three, the discourse markers. I hate that teacher, like he's totally going to fail me. And in this sense, like comes at the beginning of a sentence or a clause and usually indicates that some clarification is to come. The fourth one, the discourse particle, I'm sure I like failed that test. Uh, the difference between the discourse particle and the discourse marker is a very small one. Um, the discourse particle typically comes in the middle of the sentence and it typically alerts the listener that what comes next is of note. Now, I have to admit that I've seen even hardened lexicographers who typically try to refrain from passing judgment on language um, admit that they cannot stand like. Um, and I also have to admit that it used to bother me quite a bit as well, but I've found that being able to identify these uses has really changed my feelings in the matter. Now when I hear people using it, I instead try to just catalog them to which of these four groups it goes into, and happily for me, I'm easily amused. So, you know, <laughs> save me a lot of trouble. Um, now, while we're on the subject of objectionable things that kids supposedly say, I think we should spend a little time looking into what we might refer to as uh, the literary quality of text speak. And I'm fairly sure that saying um, the literary quality of text speak falls into the category of what Amazon refers to in their book searching algorithms as a uh, statistically improbable phrase. Um, but perhaps the most obvious example of this is the initialism. O N G. And by the way, if you ever find yourself at a dinner party and have not yet managed to properly annoy or bore those people sitting next to you, which is something I pride myself in being quite accomplished in, um, you could always launch into a rousing disposition on the difference between an acronym and an initialism. And um, in case I haven't bored or annoyed any of you, you know, um, I would do that right now. Um, <laughs> An acronym is an abbreviated word that's pronounced, such as scuba or fubar. Um, and, and initialism is an abbreviation that is spelled out like CIA or OMG. Um, and I expect that some of you are wondering what possible defense could be mounted for an OMG, since it's obviously something that has sprung recently from the diseased cortex of some phone adult teenager a few years back. But um, let's look at the earliest evidence that. Um, OMG has in that noted chronicler of teenage slang, the Oxford English Dictionary. I hear that a new order of knighthood is on the tempest. OMG, oh my god, shower it on the Admiralty. Um, the teenager in question here happens to be um, John Arbuthnot Fisher, the man who at the time of this writing, 1917, was the admiral in charge of the British Navy and he was writing a letter to another famously vapid teenager, Winston Churchill. Um, so OMG is not really that new. This, of course, is not intended as a defense of the way OMG is frequently used today, but it is an indication, I think, that words and habits that we think of as new are frequently quite a bit older than we would expect. Um, <clears throat> a further example of this is found in the early 20th century when it was not uncommon or English textbooks, particularly those aimed at the middle class, um, to include instructions specifically on how to write letters in abbreviated form, since doing so would make it cheaper to send telegrams. So, in other words, um, we were teaching children how to tweet a hundred years ago. Um, now, I'd like to start to wrap up this talk on language in the traditional manner, um, which is by offering a spirited defense of Dan Coyle and um, is spelling of potato. Um, anybody who's over the age of 30 knows two things about potato. Um, the word has no E at the end of it, and Dan Crow thought that it did. Um, and for those of you under 30, uh, one of his more well-known moments in the spotlight was when he corrected a fifth grader a spelling bee in 1992. <coughs> he would have spelled the word correctly, as it turned out. He was a moment that was rather unfortunately on camera. And it has been over 20 years since Quayle made this mistake, and he and his children are still being teased about it. Um, a few years ago, Gail Collins wrote a nice snarky column in the New York Times about Ben Quayle, Dan Quayle's son, running for Congress, which contained the line, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, are the potato. 
Um, now, why would anybody defend quail from this stone and potato? Well, uh, to start with, it's a tricky word, and if you don't believe me, just ask the English-speaking people. Um, these are all the ways we have had of spelling potato over the past 500 years. Uh, there are 65 of them, and this is not including four additional versions, which are begun with a B. Um, almost all of these variants died a peaceful death long ago, but there has been one stalwart called out, and one tenacious variant that has refused to give up the fight, and that, of course, is potato with an E at the end of it. Um, here we have the New York Times in 1988, um, when in fact the timidly seasoned filet came out, the last word of roasted peppers combined with spinach and a bland carrot and potato puree. Uh, two years later in the Washington Post, we find the caption, Annie L. James, prepare sweet potato and pumpkin pies in anticipation of a large crowd. My personal favorite from 1992, Slowly, the terrible implications dawned on Clyde and Frenwalter. Could he be rendered irrelevant by a genetically superior couch potato? Um, I'd like to point out this last one is, uh, is published about two weeks before Dan Quell met his doom, so to speak. And that this is also uh, just a smattering of the occasions in which the errant E has been attached to potatoes in major American and British newspapers in the 20th century. And they, they really exist all the way up until June of 1992, <laughs> at which point everybody seems to have suddenly woken up and learned how to spell potato, which, if nothing else, is one accomplishment we can credit to Dan Quill. Um, in my opinion, I think that the vice president, what he should have done, is stuck to his guns, insisted that he was following historical precedent, and commented on the American politicians before him who had used potato. Um, and here we have six different United States presidents um, who have spelled potato. He could have quoted George Washington, James Madison, Andrew Jackson, Ulysses Grant, James Garfield, and even beloved FDR, who, by the way, to his parents, admittedly, while he was in high school, Informing them of the first heat of the potato race we went today. Um, so, where does this leave us? Um, I think that if you're willing to accept that language changes and that the rules governing the correct use of language change as well, well, does this mean that you have to abdicate all responsibility to use language with care? I think no, of course not. Um, I think language used carefully is really um, it's an unending source of delight. But I don't think that we have to equate careful language only with correctness. And correcting language certainly need not be done with malice. Um, our literature is filled with great writers carefully bending the language, pushing it, making it represent them, and sometimes in the process, breaking it a bit. And there is no better example of a writer who wrote great English with poor grammar and usage than Shakespeare. Um, the relentless coining of words is but one of many things through which Shakespeare is vaunted. Although, as scholarship marches on, the number of words that he is credited with creating diminished considerably. It was once thought to be in the thousands, now it's more likely in the hundreds. But Shakespeare did obviously add an enormous number of words to the English vocabulary. Um, however, about 18% of the words that we think of as having been invented by Shakespeare are actually just examples of something that we heard about earlier, which is functional shift. Um, Shakespeare was the first person to use drug as a verb, and pellet and scissor as a verb. All of these words were already in use as nouns. Um, so why do we applaud Shakespeare for this? But we scold people today for seemingly debasing English through a similar use of contact or impact. Um, one obvious reason is that Shakespeare was a great writer, and we allow them liberties. Um, you could also point out the fact that Shakespeare was writing before these rules existed. To me, that seems like a bit of a cop out. One of the things that was most striking to me um, in researching this book was um, that not only does our language change continually, the meanings of words change, but the rules that govern our language are also in a constant state of flux. Um, for instance, everything that you think you know about how to use the apostrophe would have at some point in the past been considered wrong. Um, so I think we should take a page from the books of animal behaviorists who long ago discovered that positive conditioning is more effective than punishment-based training. 
Um, and instead of making people feel bad, or if you subscribe to Donald Trump's grammatical tenets, feel badly, um, <laughs> instead of making people feel bad about using language poorly, I think we should try to make them feel good for using it well. You know, one of the problems with the let's stick to our guns approach to language defense is that I think that by the time a word is being misused by enough people that it annoys you, it's almost certainly too late for you to do anything about it. Um, it is now being misused by enough people that there is no chance of you getting this toothpaste back into the tube. Um, and one thing I'd like to say in closing is that another question that I frequently receive, which is typically couched in combative terms, uh, in case anybody wants to ask this later, feel free to ask it again, um, is whether I am in favor of doing away with all the rules. Do I, people often ask incredulously, think that we should just give up on the English language? People seem, asking this seem to kind of delightedly shiver with horror as they imagine all the depredations and dignities that the poor English language would undergo if there was no one to look after it. And it's a good question. What would happen to English if we stopped worrying about whether that apostrophe was in the right spot, if it should be moved and touched to the left, and what would happen to poor Benighted Unique if it was forced to carry more than one meaning? Um, as it turns out, we don't have to wonder, since we do have a historical precedent to look at. And when William the Conqueror and his Norman invaders overran England in 1066, they did not merely supplant the House of Wessex and a nation's inexplicable affinity for boiled meat, they are also supplanted a language, which in this case was the English language. For the next several hundred years, French was the language of the court, the schools, and the legal system. Nobody paid any attention to whether English was eating its vegetables or staying out late at night drinking malt liquor and spitting its infinitives. And uh, what happened when we neglected our language for hundreds of years? The short answer is that we went from Old English to Middle, middle English. And in other words, uh, this neglect produced Chaucer. Um, so on that note, I'm going to wrap up the annoyance part of the evening and shift to the peeve part of the evening and invite queries, comments, complaints, or questions from all of you. Uh, that I really do welcome peeves and complaints, and I think uh, that any kind of passion about language is an admirable thing. Um, I'm, so I'm not only not against um, rules, I'm not against complaining by any stretch. <laughs> so. Sir. Yes. <clears throat> what about the uh, change of the use of a verb? For example, the verb to grow. Uh, it's now being used uh, in a subject which I've studied economics to grow the economy, mm -hmm. which I find dissonant in my ears. Uh, uh, how does this evolve? Uh, how do you get into the suddenly a new application or a wide application for a verb that is a legitimate verb to begin with? Right. Uh, good question. It's a subtle shift, relatively speaking. It's not like a functional shift where you're changing a part of speech. Um, I'm not intimately familiar with grow and its shift of the verb, but my um, inclination would be that uh, I, I imagine, usually in this case, the earliest use of it in that sense would be considerably older than we think. It does not, of course, mean that it was in widespread use. Um, as for how it came to be used, for instance, in growing the economy, I don't know. And I don't know that anybody else does. In some cases, we can see specific examples of how something has changed. For instance, contact was in use in New Zealand and Australia, and then it was brought back like a regrettable disease by the United States Navy. <laughs> very clear line of how you can see probably the least regrettable thing the Navy has ever brought back in that sense. But, um, you can see how that happens. As for how growth changed from growing a plant to growing an economy, I don't know. And it's a kind of a subtle shift. I can understand why it would create on your ears. Um, it's possible that it would have just been used by some, for instance, Time magazine was widely credited with destroying enormous swaths of the English language in the 1930s because they would do things like use grow 
to grow an economy. Um, so it's possible that we've started with a magazine and then spread like any manner of diseases from there. Um, yeah, in fact, I, I was about to agree with what you were saying. I, would, I don't know how many journalists are in the room at the moment, but I would blame journalists um, for that usage. Yeah, everybody else has been blaming the journalists for the past 150 years as well. So you're always in good company if you want to put the blame on somebody to pay for journalists. Right. If I may, the first time I ever heard the phrase used was by Bill Clinton when he was president, mm -hmm. and it grated on me <laughs> to grow the economy. And then I thought, well, we grow potatoes. So <laughs> right. I mean, what you can also do is it's actually very easy now if you want to go with a, I mean, one of the things that is glorious about the internet um, is that it's much easier to search for for usage this way. Collocational phrases such as "grow the economy." If you go to the New York Times and you search for grow the economy as a phrase within quotes, my guess is that it will almost certainly be seen before Clinton. And then if you go to a, a database such as ProQuest or something like that and search for, I don't know how far back you find it, but that will give you a much better picture of where the words started to be used and by whom. Right. Um, do you have any insight into the conversational, if not written, nature of the um, substitution of uh, go for say. Uh -huh. So my teacher goes, and then I go back to her. You know what? I don't, but I have the next best thing, which is I have a wife who defined go for Marion Webster uh, 20 <laughs> years ago. And uh, she defined the entirety of go, so I am going to ask her. Oh, well, I, um, I have almost nothing to say about that, except that if I, in the early 90s when I was defining go, it was it's sufficiently established in the language that Marion Webster included it. So it presumably had been around for at least 20 years, had many reputable sources in print, not just conversational. It isn't. Um, before, and that was before the 90s, so probably in the 70s and 80s, so that they put it in and kind of reified music which was already well established. What That's not that? a joke to Hi. Um, hi, I just want to share my particular peeve, which is the probably improper and overuse of the word awesome. Uh -huh. <laughs> I love that word. Do you have any comments? Yes, you are in excellent company. <laughs> Many people before you have complained. Um, however, there's always a however. Um, do you have a problem with fantastic? Yes. Not meaning of the nature of a fantasy? Yes. Do you have a problem, for instance, with, if we go a little further afield, what about awful? Not meaning worthy of all. Uh, and if we go a little further afield, we have the problem, for instance, with dilapidated being used to refer to anything but a stone house, because it comes from Latin. Um, these are all complaints, and if we go back further and further, they start to seem a trifle unhinged, so to say. <laughs> so, uh, for instance, um, zoom should only be used for upward mobility, it's a navigation term. Collide necessitates two bodies in motion. You can never come to collide standing on them. It is a contradiction in terms. Um, and I'm certainly not going to tell you that you shouldn't be annoyed by it. Um, by all means, go ahead. But I would say that as time marches on, it is likely that it will become more and more um, accepted. And another is, and part of this is that um, you know, it's. A great example, I guess, is the use of like. Everybody loves to hate like. They love to hate it at the beginning of a sentence. They hate it when their kids say it. Um, but what like is doing, in, in many cases, was echoed 100 years ago by people using another meaningless word. And Ambrose Pierce referred to this word at the beginning as a mere meaningless prelude to a sentence. People really despised this word when kids said it at the beginning of a sentence. And that word was well. Um, so 100 years ago, people despised. Well, well. the only difference between like and well is that your grandparents say well and your grandchildren say like, and that one of them comes up in the, a century later. Um, uh, 1920s people would probably not have believed you if you said, listen, people are going to be fine with well in a couple of years, don't worry. I can smooth the edges. I don't know if that would happen with awesome, but it's possible. I, I don't know if you're a sports fan. But I became aware of this uh, listening to athletes and their coaches on television. They began substituting myself for I. Uh -huh. <laughs> and yes. in 
my teammates and myself have to play better right. when we win the championship. And now every person under 30 says that. <laughs> okay. it, uh, that is what is commonly referred to as a hypercorrection. Um, which is the use of what is extensively thought to be a more prestigious form of a word that is in fact wrong. Um, <laughs> did not originate with professional athletes, um, though it is entirely likely that they helped spread. But people have also been complaining about that, at least since the 1920s, um, and that is one that people will continue to complain about. Um, a similar example is between you and I. Um, that is not a hyper correction. And that came about because people thought, well, it's correct to say, who is it? It is I, not it is me. Therefore, if it is I is correct, then between you and I must be corrector. Um, and, um, you know, it is I, it also has a long history. Shakespeare uses it, Merchant of Venice, all debts are clear between you and I. Um, dozens of other great writers have used it, people still hate it. Um, and I think the reason is that um, a lot of people, uh, particularly usage guide writers, reserve their deepest contempt for hypercorrections. Um, and so those are, they take a long time to be kind of assimilated into the accepted form of the language. Right. Why is there a difference between English publications and American publications? Their spelling is, is often different uh, than ours is. Aren't we supposed to be following the lead? I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, one uh, variation is inevitable with time. Um, so there's likewise variation between um, Australian English and British English and United States English. Um, some of it you can pin on poor old Noel Webster, who uh, helped, he really wanted to change American. And Webster saw the change in American spelling as a kind of declaration of independence. And also, it's kind of crazy, um, which helped, and uh, very stubborn. And most of the things that he suggested, changing didn't take. He wanted to spell prove, P-R-O-O-V, for instance. Um, but a lot of it was just natural change that occurs when you take two languages and two speaking groups of speakers and you put them thousands of miles away. Um, we're not supposed to follow them, I hope, because um, they're just as terrible at speaking English as we are. Um, they, they have this misguided notion frequently that they're much better at it, and it's always, uh, if you ever want to really amuse yourself, look at some um, complaints that some British language commentators have about the things that those horrible Americans are doing to our language. Almost inevitably, when they give specific instances, if you look back at where it came from, it comes from England. So, for instance, finalized. I mean, the Brits have been complaining about finalized since the 1900. The first use of finalized is in a London newspaper. This happens time and again. It's been going on for hundreds of years. They mocked Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson, for using the word belittle. He invented belittle, by the way. It's one of the few words Jefferson invented. And uh, a number of reviewers in British papers who wrote about Jefferson's notes on the state of Virginia simply so that they could scold him for using the little. And they were things like, I mean, we, we forgive you your political attacks, impotent though they may be, but we beseech you, spare. Oh, please, spare us our mother tongue. <laughs> we use it a little. Um, and so if we had followed the lead, we would not be belittling each other about the use of the mother tongue. <laughs> Um, function, that the misuse of function more than the meaning of a word. Could you speak to that? For, for example, her and I went to the store, you know, that kind of thing. Uh-huh, so okay, so yeah. the objective versus, uh, yeah, right. no. <laughs> well, it's, um, it's, I guess it's something that should make sense. So that's kind of like, um, you know, between you and I. Right. You know, so right. In certain cases, it should be um, the objective case. In certain cases, it should be the nominative case. Um, it is very easy to find um, oneself annoyed by that because it does create on the ear. Um, I think there are some, some a number of cases in which um, we do sh change which case the objective of the nominal um, is being used. Um, so, I, 
I, I, I'm afraid I don't have a quick and easy answer for you. It's just that it is something that will, will continue to annoy people, I think. And it, 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 the, the good news for you is that um, I think, by and large, within the social linguistic register that you are concerned with, people will naturally follow it. People will learn it, and they may get it wrong. Um, but the, the rules that are set up in place to preserve this are not changing very quickly. Um, so you are unlikely to see an enormous shift towards between you and I, our, her and me went to the store. Um, it will still come up, and there will be natural variation there, and there will be some people who just don't learn that particular form of the language, but most people are going to get it. Do you think it, do you think it has anything to do with the fact that we're not taught to, um, uh, we're not taught English in the same way, and we, we don't diagram sentences, for example? Uh -huh. like that's, uh, that's what I like to think of is the, the notion that we were all so much smarter before the universal <laughs> education came on. <laughs> we, uh, we seem, um, no, I don't think so. Um, I, I think that the, the, the basic building blocks of language that most of us learn, we learn without having our knuckles wrapped for improperly diagramming the sentence. Um, I, I think it's great to diagram sentences. I'm glad that I was poorly taught. Well, I was taught very well, but I learned very poorly. Um, how to do something is great, but um, I don't think that it necessarily will change an entire nation's grasp of grammar. I think grammar is learned more in a in a more innate way than eighth grade. Um, Danny. Um, Anna, I was wondering if you could say a little more about sort of like the social history of how these definitional changes happen. So something like enormous moving from being about sin to being about size seems like an incredible transformation. Or even like, aside from blaming the journalists, how <laughs> else do these evolutions in, in linguistic meaning um, I think it, it varies from word to word. Um, sometimes it's simply a mistake. Um, in fact, often it's simply a mistake. The huge amounts of the English language, uh, what we think of as the English language, things that we think of now as correct, that were formed just by somebody being wrong. Um, so enormous, uh, I don't know exactly why enormous shifted from great sin to great size. Um, but. I should also point out that it was not simply those two meanings. There have been many other meanings of enormity and enormous as well. Um, sometimes it has to do with legal matters. Sometimes it's not really possible to tell. For instance, disinterested and uninterested. Many people like to think that these are sacrosanct meanings. The disinterested should be impartial. We want an impartial, a disinterested judge, and un uninterested is you know, your, your kids. You, know, you tend to have uninterested kids. Um, except that when the words first came on the scene, they mean the opposite. They changed meaning almost immediately. When they first were used, uninterested meant impartial, disinterested meant bored. Um, nobody knows why they slept, but they did. Um, in terms of mistakes, um, for instance, the word fruition used to mean fruition, and then somebody said, hey, it's got fruit in it. <laughs> so that caught on. Um, same thing with internison which I'm sure I'm pronouncing wrong. It used to mean widespread destruction, and then that noted butcher of language, Samuel Johnson, got his hands on the word, and when he defined Tennyson, he just saw the prefix I-N-T-E-R, and he thought, well, that must mean mutual. So he defined it as mutual destruction, and that was entirely wrong, but that's the only sense in which we now use it. Um, I noticed a shift in probably the last 10 years in comparison. Um, I haven't, but I'm sure that it's, it exists that people are noticing and, and studying it. Um, I think comparatives, well, they, they do shift, for instance. Um, Shakespeare had a lot more, um, a little more liberal with his comparatives, for instance. Now, it's very difficult to say what is right and what is wrong about comparatives and how we modify them. Um, Shakespeare, now we typically think of it's two syllables and it ends in a certain way and you can make it er or est, but if it's three syllables and you have to say more or those, and if it ends in a certain way, right, but there was no clear delineation of these rules. And so Shakespeare was using three, well, it's still like unhealthier, but you can still, it's okay. So if you prefix it with an un, then you can have a three syllable word. Um, Shakespeare would write things like honorable list or honorable er. 
And then it started to kind of get narrowed down in the 1700s. So we do have a process of change. Um, one of the things that actually made me write this book was, um, now that you brought this up, was when I had written a previous book about the Oxford Dictionary. I was giving some radio interviews, and I would fall into this habit of repeating myself sometimes. And one of the things I would say is, um, I've never come away from reading a dictionary feeling stupider. And um, I started noticing I got a lot of angry letters from people who were really not out of shape about this. Essentially saying, uh, you know, when you say stupid, it really does make you sound <laughs> quite stupid. Um, I, I, thought, well, I, I was honestly befuddled by this. I, nobody had ever told me stupid is not a word until this point. And so I started looking into well, why isn't stupid a word? And I really looked. I, I spent a lot of time looking, and there's no reason why stupid is not a word. It's what we would refer to as a disyllabic comparative adjective that ends with an alveolar stop, which is a fancy way of saying it's a two-syllable adjective that you stop by touching your tongue to the ridge of tissue right behind your teeth. So another example of this is polite, uh, solid, and politer. I think that's okay. Nobody's going to come at me with a bat saying polite is not a word you fool, but for some reason we got this notion that stupider is not a word. So. Um, it's, it's, again, it's a thing that's it's a little bit amorphous, why people do this and why they don't. Uh, the fellow back there? What? Yeah? Thank you.